You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. The gospel had a twofold effect. They received the gospel, but there was much affliction. Ah, the first effect was an outward effect. It was external persecution. But here's the great thing. It was counterbalanced by the second effect, an inner effect, and that's internal joy. Notice they received the gospel in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So while they were enduring all the affliction, they had the joy of the Holy Spirit. They had joy in trials. Imagine that. Have you ever known a Christian who just seemed to be filled with joy no matter what they were going through? It's infectious and inspiring, isn't it? It may even help lift you up in a moment of struggle. In today's message, Pastor Ron will encourage us to approach our lives with an eternal perspective. Weigh your circumstances by their eternal value, not the temporary discomfort or anxiety they may bring. When you keep Jesus in focus, your trials lose their power over you. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. The Young Men's Christian Association, also known as the YCMA, uh, YMCA, they celebrated their 170th anniversary. If you didn't know, it was on June 4th, 1844, 12 young men met in the bedroom of George Williams in London, England. They'd come together to develop a strategy for evangelizing the masses who were now pouring into the city looking for work. And Williams' plan was very simple. He prayed that other Christians around him for salvation in the place that they worked. And he worked for three years in a place, a drapery company of Hitchcock and Rogers, which had become shifted as a result of the testimony there. It was a place that was almost impossible to be a Christian. And in three short years, it was trans, uh, translated into a place where it was almost, to be, almost impossible to be anything but a Christian. The success of so many coming to Christ at this place of employment led Williams to expand the ministry, even to other businesses. The expansion also included lecture courses, reading rooms, and sports facilities, which we're familiar with. In all these activities, Williams and the founders of the YMCA regarded evangelism as the primary goal. Now, 50 years later, still 1884, Queen Victoria knighted Williams for his distinguished work of evangelism in their country. However, that said, Today, most people don't even know what the letter C stands for, right, which is Christian, in the YMCA. Why is that? Because they've lost the edge of evangelism. One person said this, the edge of evangelism can be easily lost when it becomes the secondary goal. Well, as we're continuing to look at this church in Thessalonica, we're going to see that evangelism wasn't the secondary goal. It was the primary goal. It was a church that got ignited by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they ignited others. We're going to see that the Thessalonians heard it, they received it, they lived it, they proclaimed it, and they confirmed it. Now, first thing we're going to see in verse 5 is that they heard the gospel. And by the way, if you were with us last week, if you weren't, we'll recap very quickly. Paul came to this city in Acts chapter 17 for the first time, and he went into the synagogue as he did week after week, only for three weeks. He was here only a month, and he proclaimed the gospel, and many were saved. But some were furious that people were saved, and it says there was a mob, and they gathered to the place where Paul was staying, but they couldn't find him, so they took Jason, the guy whose house it was, and others, and they dragged him out in the seat, in the streets, and they were going to beat him, and of course the whole thing was halted. But Paul had to leave, so he only got to be in this location anywhere between three and four weeks. He headed off to Berea, about 40 miles away, and those people still followed him there. They were so antagonistic against the gospel. But Paul came and he preached the gospel to these people. That word is used here in verse 5, the gospel. Uh, the Greek word is euangelion. And it, we get our English word evangelize from it. The gospel is the good news. It is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, for my sins, that whoever soever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now, this is what Paul did. He came and he preached the gospel. Now, notice he says in verse 5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. In other words, though we brought the word, realize it didn't come in word only. In other words, it wasn't our words that transformed lives. 
we used our words to convey the message. But no matter how brilliant or how eloquent a person's words are, they can't change a person's life, right? My words can't change a person's life. So notice he says, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. Paul knew that the power to transform a person's life didn't come in his great elocution, though he was a great speaker. But it came within the very power of the very word itself. There's a great passage in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, and it says this, for the word of God is living, it's alive, and it is powerful. It transforms lives. And listen, if you've ever shared the gospel with someone and saw their life changed, you know it had nothing to do with you. You become very aware. Wow, all I did was share the truth. And it transformed their lives. Exactly. That's why when Jesus gave the parable of the sower, he likened the word of God to the seed. The power is not in the sower. All he does is toss the seed. The power is in the seed. And when that seed, the word of God, hits a fertile heart, boom, it is changed. And that's important for us to know because sometimes we spend so much time thinking about how to package the gospel, right? Now, if I do it this way and I talk to them this certain way and I put together these certain verses and, or if I have everything together, then I'll share my faith. And what happens is we worry so much about packaging it that we don't share it. Sometimes we're even intimidated. I don't know it well enough. Well, listen, all you got to do is open up a passage of God's word and share it. Share it. Because salvation doesn't have to do with us at all. It has everything to do with the power that is in the word of God. It was Peter that even said to Jesus in John 6 and verse 68, Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. Your words, the truth of God's word, changes lives. It's in the word itself. So notice Paul says when we preach the gospel, it didn't come in our word only, but also in power. And then he adds, secondly, and in the Holy Spirit. That's essential. It is the Holy Spirit that illuminates the human mind to see the truth. It is the Holy Spirit that allows us to see what the gospel is, that it truly is good news. Only the Holy Spirit can do that because outside of the Holy Spirit, we don't get it. In fact, we're told that in 2 Corinthians 2, 14. It says the natural man doesn't understand the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. And so without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the natural man, the unsaved man, doesn't understand the gospel. It seems simplistic. It seems foolish. But when the Holy Spirit makes the word of God alive, which is what he does, it's life-changing. In fact, we're told in Ephesians 6, 17 that the word of God is called the sword of the spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that takes the word of God like a sword and pierces the heart. It, 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 it allows us to see our need for a savior. And so when we're changed, when we're actually transformed, Jesus actually said we're born of the spirit, John chapter three. So the Holy Spirit plays a key role. So Paul says, when we brought to you the gospel, it wasn't our words, it was the power of God's word illuminated by the Holy Spirit. That's how it came. But it also came and it did something else. Look at it, there's a third thing here in verse five. It also came in much assurance. Now that word in the original language means conviction. In fact, if you have an NIV, it says it came in deep conviction. Jesus said in John 16, 8, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. Convict. What does it mean to convict? It means to reveal a person's guilt, right? Now, in order to be transformed by the good news, the gospel, I have to be convicted. I have to see my guiltiness. And let me tell you, I certainly did. Before the gospel, I just did whatever I did. I wanted to do. I didn't feel guilty at all. I just did it. Whatever felt good, do it. As soon as the Holy Spirit illuminated the truth of the scriptures, I realized, wait a second, I, man, I've, I've sinned. And so the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to convict the people of God so they're transformed. So Paul reminds the Thessalonian believers that when he came, he preached the full gospel. And then he also says that he maintained a godly example while doing it. Because notice he adds in verse 5, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. 
You see, Paul was fully aware that the message of the gospel can never be separated from the character of the person who communicates it, right? That, that's vitally important. You and I can tell people about the gospel. This is so awesome. It'll change your life. But if your life isn't changed, if you're not a new person, then what good is it? I really don't want it, you know, if, if it hasn't changed you. That's hypocritical. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you draw near to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. In other words, you tell people what is right, but you don't live it. Your lives don't match your lips. So here's the thing. God has given us his word, and he uses human beings to communicate that truth. Do you realize that even God himself did that? What do you mean? Well, we're told that God didn't stop in communicating his word. He gave us an example. We're told in John 1, 14, and you're familiar with the passage. It says, and the word, speaking of Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God didn't give us a message only. He gave his son the embodiment of that truth to say, there's how you live it. Now, are we going to live like Jesus perfect? Of course not. But our desire is to be an example to those who we communicate the truth to. So Paul says, we came and you heard the gospel and we sought to live it as we were with you. So first he says, when we came to Thessalonica, they heard the gospel. Now there's a second thing in verse six. Not only did they hear it, they received it. And when you heard it, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. That word received there, by the way, in the original language, means to willingly welcome. Of their own volition, having heard the gospel truth, the Thessalonians willingly welcomed Christ into their hearts. So that, he says, they became followers, followers of us. That word followers is the Greek word mimetai. We get our English word mimic from it, to mimic, to, to copy. So what he says is this, we communicated the truth, we lived godly lives in front of you, and you sought to mimic that, to follow that, which is a good thing. That's a great thing. Thank God that he gives us examples in our life of someone we can actually follow. They're not perfect, but we say there's a person that loves Jesus, there's a person who's living it out. This is a quality that Paul spoke of much in the scriptures. For example, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, brethren, Join in following my example as you have us for a pattern. God will give us people to pattern our lives with. And that's a good thing. Paul wrote later in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, he said, imitate me. Same word, by the way, used here. Mimitai. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. So to the degree, Paul says, as I'm following Jesus, follow that. It's good to have an example. So he says in verse 6, you became followers of us and of the Lord, which, of course, ultimately, it's all about. It's all about following Jesus Christ. But he gives us examples. So here's the thing. They heard the gospel, and they received the gospel following that truth. And when they received the gospel, it had a twofold effect. Notice this. They received the word in much affliction, verse 6, and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, first, they received the gospel in not a little affliction, but much affliction. That word affliction, by the way, in the Greek language is philipsis. Uh, it means heavy pressure, severe difficulty. Now, if you were with us last week, we talked about this young church, and I mentioned to you a little bit just a minute ago, that this was a church birthed out of adversity, They'd just gotten out of the chute. They've just began, and immediately there was a mob, and people were persecuting this young church. There were some people hired in the inner city, some thugs, trying to kill Paul and perhaps others. So think about this. This church is birthed in difficulty, in affliction. There, the whole thing, and if you were part of this church, there was difficulty. That's not the way it is for us, Right? We don't know that kind of difficulty. We don't know what it's like to start a, a church and people say, get out of here, and there's a mob. Get out of here. We, we don't know anything of that kind of persecution. We have brothers and sisters that do. In northern India, that's exactly what happens. By the way, if you're in northern India and you give your life to Jesus Christ, first of all, you're, you're kicked out of the family. You have nobody. So you find other believers like it. When you find other believers, you start a church. And when you start a church like that, people throw rocks and sticks at you. 
and some even will burn your place down. That happens. Happens in the Middle East. So this is the kind of persecution they dealt with. So the gospel had a twofold effect. They received the gospel, but there was much affliction. Ah, the first effect was an outward effect. It was external persecution. But here's the great thing. It was counterbalanced by the second effect, an inner effect, and that's internal joy. Notice they received the gospel in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So while they were enduring all the affliction, they had the joy of the Holy Spirit. They had joy in trials. Imagine that. Peter talks about this. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, Now, if needs be, you've been grieved by many trials. Verse 7, though you are tested by fire, though, in verse 8, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. Are you kidding me? You're going through trials, but you got this joy that's just so hard to describe. It's so awesome. How can that be? It's because God gives us his joy in the midst of difficulty. And this is why James could say in, chap in James chapter 1 and verse 2, count it all joy, yippee, when you fall into various trials. See, because we view those two issues, joy and trials, as mutually exclusive. And we never want them, we, we don't think of them together. Paul puts them together here. You receive the gospel in much affliction, but joy of the Holy Spirit. And that's the key. It was joy in the Holy Spirit. See, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 tells us the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of really being a believer is there's love that comes out of your life, but it's love and joy. Joy even in the midst of difficulty. Your outward circumstance is very difficult, but there's joy. Hey, that's the example of the early church. Do you remember when the early church just got underway in the early chapters of the book of Acts? They got saved and the religious leaders arrested the, the disciples. And they beat them up. And they arrest them again, and they beat them up. Stop talking about this Jesus. And it tells us in Acts 5.41 that they left there and rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. What a joy. We could be beat up for Jesus. Awesome. Really? So God is faithful in the affliction that we're going through to give us even joy. And again, we don't know that as Americans. I mean, our, our affliction is, you know, you may have... Uh, a friend drop you because you're a Christian. You could be made of fun of in the media, on the internet, all the time, or on, you know, television. That's not a whole lot of persecution. It can get worse. And I got to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, I think it will be worse before Jesus comes. Honestly, I, re I really do. But I have found that in times of crisis, the gospel opens up even more, and more people are responsive to the gospel. During the Gulf War, we are told, because I know some chaplains, we are told that chaplains had their services full during the Gulf War. Why? Well, my, I may lose my life on the field. I want to know Jesus. And we know that when difficulties take place, we're more open to the gospel. My goodness, I remember locally here when we had Hurricane Ike. It's been about six years. Oh, my goodness. So many people were open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Crisis opens our hearts to that. So maybe we need some more crisis. Maybe we need some more persecution, right? That's how the early church flourished. Now, we're not all, I love them signing up for persecution. Where's the persecution sign up? I know there's a marriage cruise coming. I'll sign up for that. I know the women say, where's the, per I'd like to sign up for the persecution sheet. That would be awesome. Yes, bring it on. We're not, no one's, it would be empty, right? But crisis, persecution, affliction, that's often when the gospel flourishes. That's how it did for them. They received the gospel. That's what they got. But here's the thing. They heard the gospel. They received the gospel. Here's the third thing in verse seven. They lived the gospel. Look at this, verse 7. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Talk about being ignited. These people heard it, they received it, and more importantly now, they're living it. They're living it in front of everybody so that they're becoming examples to other people. In verse 6, remember, they were the followers. They were the imitators. Now over time, they are those being imitated. Isn't that great? So here you have a small church, a young church, right? Right? And yet they've matured to a place where now other people are looking to them as being an example. By the way, the word example here in the Greek is tupon. And it means uh, or describes a mark that's been left by an impression, a diecast specifically. 
minting coins. Now, when you took this, the metal and you put it in the die cast, you stamp it really heavy and you leave the mark there. That's how you cast coins. Paul is saying to these believers here, you've grown to the point that in your walks, you're leaving your mark. You've left your mark in your city. You're leaving the mark in other cities as well. Isn't that powerful? They started following Paul's example. Now they were example to other. This is a sign of true maturity. Can I give you an example of immaturity? Because we have one in the scriptures as well. We find it in the book of Hebrews. The writer to the Hebrews has to write to this particular church these words. Hebrews 5.12. Though by this time you ought to be teachers of others, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. What a tragedy. To be a mature church, to be a church that should be teaching others, yet they remained immature. And by the way, there are churches like that today. They've been around for years. Years. And yet they've never grown. Why? Well, because all they get is a small little diet every single week. It's the same thing. It's milk. Got a little milk. A little milk. A little milk. Oh, we're not going to open up that Bible. We may, we, may, we may have astronomical teaching. You know what I call astronomical teaching? That's when you open them to the Bible, read one verse, you blast off, you never come back. Right? Or, you know, skyscraper sermons. That's when it's built on one story after another story after another story after another story. But there's no content. We need the Word of God. That's meat that will change your life. That's why our billboard, if you haven't seen it, it says you won't leave here hungry. I guarantee you, if you keep coming to the church, you will not go hungry. Now, it may be difficult at first. I remember someone said, the first time I came to your church, I came for a few weeks, I felt like my mouth was being stuffed with steak. <laughs> I, I was such a young Christian, I didn't even know how to take it all. It was so much. I was so used to being milk-fed, getting meat-fed. But here was a church that then had grown, maturity. And now they were an example to others. So here's a question. Let's, let's make it practical. Are you the kind of believer that others can follow? That's a fair question, right? Are you leaving your mark wherever you go? That's, that's what they did, right? Can you say to other people, follow me, because I'm following Christ? Or let's put it another way. If every Christian in the church were like you, what kind of church would it be? Those are some good, serious questions to ask ourselves. Well, these people, they lived it, right? They lived it. And they became examples, it says, in Macedonia and Achaia. That's the northern and southern provinces of, of ancient Greece. And here's the other thing. Listen, not only were they examples to the unbelieving world, but we're also told they were examples to those, it says in this passage, to those who believe. That's amazing. They were example to other churches that hadn't grown up. Let me say this. I believe this is the kind of example God wants our church to be. And he's doing that. But this, if, if you want to know, Pastor, what's your heart? What's your prayer? My prayer is that we be this kind of church. That we be kind of church that is, is, is being an example to the world, to the unbeliever, and to the believers. What do you mean the believers? Well, because the church in America and around this area is anemic, if you don't know that. It is anemic. The reason why we've been on the radio for so many years here in Houston, some 20 years, and we will remain, and we're in other places, is because the church is getting fed through that. Unbelievers are getting saved, but the church is being fed. What do you mean the church? Well, because people are going to churches every Sunday and they're not getting fed. They're not growing up. But I know people that are hearing the radio going, man, thank God, as I thank God for many great radio teachers that are on the radio. I thank God for those that are giving the true word of God to grow. What a blessing. But that's the example that God wants us to be. And I have to honest, be honest with you. First of all, you, just so you know, Calvary Chapel is not the only church. Not our church, for sure. And not even the Calvary Chapel movement. There are other great churches. I will say this, though, without apologizing, I do believe that the Calvary Chapel movement is a prototype movement for the church. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is teaching through the book of 1 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul was arguably one of the greatest Christian missionaries and wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Yet Paul tells the Thessalonians that everything is done by God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Paul didn't try to convince the Thessalonians with flattery or fancy language. He merely preached the gospel to them, and it was the Holy Spirit who opened their hearts to accept God's word and transform their lives. Which areas of your life do you need the power of the Holy Spirit to work in today? We'd be happy to speak with you or even connect with you on our website. You can reach us at 281-648-5800. That number again is 281-648-5800. If you'd rather connect on our website, go to ltlradio.org and scroll to the bottom of the page. There, you'll find a form you can fill out to connect. We'd love to hear from you. Larger Than Life is a radio ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint. To hear more messages like this one, head over to ltlradio.org. You can even download our mobile app to access all of Pastor Ron's teachings. Once more, all you need to know is ltlradio.org. Thanks for joining us today on Larger Than Life.